Chapter 14. They flew through dark tunnels for hours. Gregor felt Boots' little head sink down on his shoulder, and he let her go. You couldn't let her nap too long during the day, or she'd wake up in the middle of the night wanting to play. But how could he keep her awake when it was dark and she couldn't move? He'd deal with it later. The gloom brought all Gregor's negative thoughts back. His dad imprisoned by rats. His mom crying. The dangers of taking Boots on this unknown voyage and his own fear at the pillar. When he felt the bat coasting down for a landing, he was relieved again at the distraction, although he disliked meeting up with Luke's and Henry again. He was sure they would be more smug and patronizing than ever. They dipped into a cavern that was so low the bat's wings brushed both the ceiling and the floor. When they landed, Gregor dismounted, but couldn't straighten up without bumping his hard hat. The place reminded him of a pancake, round and large and flat, He could see why the cockroaches had chosen it. The bats couldn't fly well, and the humans and rats couldn't fight properly with four-foot-high ceilings. He roused Boots, who seemed to enjoy her new surroundings. She toddled around, standing on tiptoe to touch the ceiling with her fingers. Everyone else just sat on the ground and waited. The bats hunched over, twitching at what Gregor supposed were sounds he couldn't even hear. A delegation of roaches appeared and bowed low. The humans got on their knees and bowed back, so Gregor did the same. Not one to stand on ceremony, Boots ran up with her arms extended in greetings. Bugs! Beak bugs! she cried. A happy murmur ran through a group of roaches. Be she the princess? Be she? Be she the one, Tim? Be she? Boots singled out one roach in particular and patted it between the antenna. Hi, you! Go ride? We go ride? Knows me? The princess? Knows me? said the roach in awe and all the other roaches gave little gasps. Even the humans and bats exchanged looks of surprise. We go ride. More ride, said Boots. Big Bug, take Boots ride, she said, patting him more vigorously on the head. Gentle Boots, said Gregor, hurrying to catch her hand. He placed it softly on the bug's head. Be gentle, like with puppy dogs. Oh, gentle, gentle said Boots, lightly bouncing her palm on the roach. It quivered with joy. (gasps) Knows the princess. Knows me? Knows me the princess. Recalls she the ride, does she? Gregor peered closely at the roach. Oh, are you the one who carried her to the stadium? He asked. The roach nodded in assent. I be Temp. I be, he said. Now Gregor knew what all the fuss was about. To his eyes, Temp looked exactly like the other 20 roaches sitting around. How on earth could Boots have picked him out of the crowd? Ficus looked at him with raised eyebrows, as if asking for an explanation. But Gregor could only shrug and reply. It was pretty weird. More ride? pleaded Boots. Temp fell on his face reverently, and she clambered onto his back. For a minute, everybody just watched them pattering around the chamber. Then Ficus cleared his throat. Crawlers, we have grave matters to place before you. Take us to your king? Take us? The roaches reluctantly tore themselves away from watching Boots and led Vicus and Solove away. Oh, great, thought Gregor. Here we are again. He felt even less comfortable than when Vicus had left the first time. Who knew what Henry and Luxa might do now? And then there was the matter of the giant roaches. He didn't feel particularly safe in the bugs' land. Just yesterday, he had considered trading him and Boots to the rats. Well, at least it was Merith who seemed decent enough. And the bats weren't too bad. Temp and one other roach named Tick had stayed behind. They completely ignored the rest of the party while they took turns giving the toddler rides. The five bats gathered together in a clump and fell asleep, exhausted from the day's flight. Merith placed the torches together to make a small fire and put on some food to warm. Henry and Luke sat apart speaking in low voices, which was fine with Gregor. Merith was the only one he liked talking to anyway. So, can you tell the crawlers apart, Merith? asked Gregor. He dumped all his batteries on the ground to sort out the dead ones while they talked. No, it is most rare that your sister can. Among us are few that can make distinctions. Ficus is better than most. But to pick one from so many? It is passing strange, said Merith. Perhaps it is a gift to the Overlanders, he suggested. No, they look identical to me, said Gregor. 
Boots was really good at those games where they gave you four pictures that all looked alike except one had a tiny difference. Like there were four party hats and one had seven stripes instead of six. And if they were all drinking from paper cups, she always knew whose was whose, even if they got mixed up on the table together. Maybe every roach really did look distinctly different to her. Gregor opened up the flashlight. It took two D-sized batteries. He swapped the other batteries in and out, trying to determine which one still had power. As he worked, he inadvertently flipped the switch on when the flashlight was pointing at Luke's and Henry. They jumped, unaccustomed to sudden bursts of light. He did it a couple more times on purpose, which was childish, but he liked seeing them flinch. They'd last about five seconds in New York City, he thought. That made him feel a little better. Of the ten batteries, all but two still had juice. Gregor opened up the compartment on his hat and found it ran on some special rectangular battery. Not having any replacements, he would have to use it sparingly. Maybe I should save this for last. If I lose the others or they go dead, I'll still have this on my head, he thought. He clicked off the light on the hat. Gregor put the good batteries back in his pocket and set the other two aside. These two are duds, he said to Maris. They don't work. Shall I burn them? asked Maris, reaching for the batteries. Gregor caught his wrist before he could toss them in the flames. No, they might explode. He didn't really know what would happen if you put a battery in the fire, but he had a vague memory of his dad saying it was a dangerous thing to do. Out of the corner of his eye, he caught Luke's and Henry exchanging uneasy glances. You could blind yourself, he added, just for effect. Well, that might happen if they exploded. Merith nodded and gingerly set the batteries back by Gregor. He rolled them around with his sandal, making Lucas and Henry nervous. But when he saw that Merith looked nervous too, he stuck the duds in his pocket. Ficus and Solave returned just as the food was ready. They looked worried. Everyone gathered round as Merith passed out fish, bread, and something that reminded Gregor of a sweet potato but wasn't. Boots, dinner time, said Gregor, and she ran over. When she realized they weren't following, she turned her head and waved impatiently to the roaches. Temp, ticka, dinner. An awkward social moment. No one else had thought to invite the roaches. Merith had not prepared enough food. Clearly, it wasn't standard to dine with roaches. Fortunately, they shook their heads. No, princess. We eat not now. They started to scurry away. Stay there, said Boots, pointing at Tick and Temp. You stay there, big bugs and the roaches obediently sat down. Boots, said Gregor, embarrassed. You don't have to stay. She orders everybody around, he told the roaches. It's just that she wants to keep playing with you, but she has to eat first. We will sit, said one stiffly, and Gregor had the feeling the bug wanted him to mind his own business. Everyone ate hungrily except Vicus, who seemed distracted. So, when leave we, asked Henry, through a mouthful of fish. We do not, said Solave. The crawlers have refused to come. Luke's head snapped up indignantly. Refused? On what grounds? They do not wish to invite the anger of King Gorger by joining our quest, said Vicus. They have peace with both humans and rats now. They do not want to unseat it. Now what, thought Gregor. They needed two roaches. It said so in the prophecy of Grey. If the roaches didn't come, could they still rescue his father? We have asked him to rethink this position, said Solave. They know the rats are on the march. This may sway them in our direction. Or in the rats, muttered Luxa, and Gregor secretly agreed. The roaches had debating trading overlanders to the rats, even when they knew the rats would eat them. And that was yesterday, when there was no war. If boots hadn't been so appealing, no doubt they would be dead now. The roaches weren't fighters. Gregor thought they would do what was best for their species, and the rats were probably the stronger ally. Or they would be if you could trust them. What makes the roaches believe they can trust the rats? Asked Gregor. The crawlers do not think in the same manner we do, said Vicus. How do they think? Asked Gregor. Without reason or consequence, Henry broke in angrily. They are the stupidest of creatures in the Underland. Why, they can barely even speak. Silence, Henry said Vicus sharply. Gregor glanced back at Temp and Tick, but the roaches gave no sign that they had heard. Of course they had. The roaches didn't seem too bright, but it was just rude to say it in front of them. Besides, it wasn't going to make them want to come along. Remember you, when Sandwich arrived in the Underland, the crawlers had been here for countless generations. No doubt they will remain when all thought of warm blood is past, said Vicus. That is rumor, said Henry dismissively. 
No, it's not. Cockroaches have been around like 350 million years, and people haven't even been here six, said Gregor. His dad had showed him a timeline of when different animals had evolved on Earth. He remembered being impressed by how cockroaches were. How do you know this? Luxa spoke abruptly, but Gregor could tell she was actually interested. It's science. Archaeologists dig up fossils and stuff, and they can tell how old things are. Cockroaches, I mean crawlers, are really old. And they've never changed much, said Gregor. He was getting on shaky ground here, but he thought that was true. They're pretty amazing. He hoped Temp and Tick were listening. Vicus smiled at him. For a creature to survive so long, it is, no doubt, as smart as it need be. I do not believe in your science, said Henry. The crawlers are weak. They cannot fight. They will not last. That is how nature intended it. Gregor thought of his grandma, who was old and dependent on the kindness of stronger people now. He thought of Boots, who was little and couldn't yet open a door. And there was his friend Larry, who had to go to the hospital emergency room three times last year when his asthma flared up and he couldn't get air into his lungs. Is that what you think, Luxa? said Gregor. Do you think something deserves to die if it's not strong? It does not matter what I think, if that is the truth said Luxa evasively. But is it the truth? That is an excellent question for the future ruler of Regalia to ponder, said Vicus. They ate quickly and Vicus suggested they all try to sleep. Gregor had no idea if it was night or not, but he felt tired and didn't object. While he spread out a thin woven blanket at the edge of the chamber, Boots tried to teach Temp and Tick to play patty cake. The roaches waved their front legs in confusion, not understanding what was going on. Pat cake, pat cake, bake a man. Bake me cake, fast you can. Pat it, pick it, mark with a B. Put it in oven for Big Bug and me, sang Boots as she clapped and touched the roach's feet. The bugs were completely baffled. What sings the princess? What sings? asked Temp, or maybe it was Tick. It's a song we sing with babies in the overland, said Gregor. She put you in it. That's a big honor he said. She only puts someone in a song if she really likes them. Me like Big Bug, said Boots with satisfaction, and sang the song again with the roaches. Sorry, guys. She has to sleep now, said Gregor. Come on, Boots. Sleepy time. Say good night. Boots spontaneously hugged the roaches. Night, Big Bug. Seep tight. Gregor was glad she left out. Don't let the bed bugs bite. Gregor snuggled down with her under the blanket on the hard stone floor. After her long nap, she wasn't very sleepy. He let her play with the flashlight for a while, clicking it on and off, but he was afraid she'd run down the batteries, and it was making the underlanders restless. Finally, he got her to settle down and sleep. As he drifted off, he thought he heard Temp, or maybe it was Tick, whispering, Honors us, the princess? Honors us? He didn't know what woke him, but by the stiffness in his neck, he must have been lying on the hard floor for hours. He drowsily reached over to pull Boots' warm body next to him, but he found only cold stone. His eyes snapped open and he sat up. His lips parted to call her name as his vision came into focus. No sound came out. Boots was in the center of the big round chamber, rocking from foot to foot as she turned calmly in a circle. The flashlight she held illuminated the room in sections. He could see the figures stretching out in every direction, in perfect concentric rings. They swayed in unison, some to the left, some to the right, with slow, mesmerizing movements. <laughs>